There are certain passages of Scripture that are very familiar to most Christians, especially if you're brought up in a Christian home. You've heard these at camp, you've heard it in Sunday school, you've heard them in vacation Bible school, but there are just certain passages of Scripture that we know by heart, so much so that if I begin a verse, you could probably just fill in the blank for me, right? Right? For instance, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the... All right, see, you guys are good. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Nice, wow, that's awesome. John 3, 16, for God. I hear some King James, I hear some New International Version. It's all good, though. But again, as Christians, there are just some passages of Scripture we're brought up with and we, we kind of know by heart. Again, especially, especially if your folks were Christian and you were raised in a, in a church and you went to Sunday school and you did all that. Now, if that wasn't the case, that's fine. That's all right. Nothing wrong with that either. Um, it's awesome to come to Christ later in life. But for the Jews, during the time of Jesus, there would have been those Scripture passages. For these Jews who are, who are brought up believing in God, for these Jews who, who are brought up quoting scripture by heart, there are just some scripture passages that were more meaningful than others. That someone would just have to start the passage of scripture and they could, they could fill in the rest of the blanks. And one of those passages, passages of scripture that they would have known by heart was Psalm 22. Every, every Jew would have known it during the time of Jesus. You just have to, to begin it, and they could fill in the, the, the rest by themselves. And what we're doing this morning is we're looking at the last words, the final words of Jesus Christ on the cross. And today we come to a text where Jesus quotes from Psalm 22. So I want to look at Matthew 27, verses 45 through 46. Again, we're in the midst of a sermon series. We're looking at the last words, the final words of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus will be doing in this text is quoting from this very familiar psalm, Psalm 22. But the text reads, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the thing about this psalm, Psalm 22, that begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason why it was so popular for the Jews, the reason why all of them knew it was because Psalm 22 is a prophecy. It's a prediction written by David a thousand years before Jesus was born, but it predicted the coming of a Savior. It was a prophecy about the Messiah, about the one who would come to save God's people. Remember, Jesus is, is dying on a cross. He's nailed to this tree, and so I don't think he has the strength or the energy to quote the entire psalm. There's 31 verses. But just by beginning the Psalter, the people would have known exactly what he was referring to. So what I, I thought we would do this morning is just kind of look at that Psalm, Psalm, 20, Psalm 22. Now we don't have time to look at all 31 verses, so maybe you want to go home and sometime before now and, and Good Friday or Easter read the entire Psalm to yourself. But there are particular verses I want to, I want to point out to you. And really the first one is that very first very first uh, line, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I think there's a couple reasons why Jesus quoted this very verse. Number one, to direct the people's attention to this, to this psalm. This psalm of a Savior, this psalm of a Messiah, of a, of, a, of a Christ. But number two, to the people, it would have looked very much like God had abandoned Jesus while on the cross. 
In Jewish tradition, in Jewish custom, only those who died on a tree, those, those people were cursed. They saw them as being cursed. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, it tells us, if someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, a tree, cross, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So if you were, if you were killed on a pole or a tree, or a cross. The Jewish people saw that as being cursed by God. And what's interesting, you take the body off of the pole, not to respect the body, but to respect the land. That person is cursed. They don't want the land to be cursed. And so they are to take them off the cross so they are not there overnight. So the people witnessing Jesus' death on the cross, they would have seen him as being cursed, as abandoned by God. Now for us, we know the rest of the story. We know the truth. We know that Jesus was not cursed. Jesus was not abandoned by God. God was there every step of the way. But the thing that was going on is that Jesus was there because of our curse. Because of our sin. Because of our death. Jesus wasn't cursed, but he was taking on himself the curse of humanity. He died so that we could live. Going on to verse 6 of Psalm 22. The psalm about the Messiah, the Christ. It reads, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. So imagine Jesus on the cross. The people before him, throwing insults at him. despising him, scorning him. But there's also that first part of this verse, but, but, I, but I am a worm. Now in Hebrew, that word worm has many different connotations. It, it can mean simply an insect. It can be used as a term of derision to call someone a worm. I mean, a, a, worm, do, a worm does not have a backbone. Or, in Hebrew, this specific type of worm was actually crushed and used as red dye. So much so, much so that this, this Hebrew word in Psalm 22.6 is the exact same Hebrew word we find in Exodus 25.4. I mean, it's the same word exactly. But in Exodus 25.4, it's translated as scarlet. And so we have Jesus on the cross. Not only is he being scorned, not only is he being made fun of, but there he is on the cross, crushed, bleeding, that crimson, scarlet flow of blood, which cleanses us of our sin. Verses 7 and 8. And I just want to compare this to, to Matthew 27, 42 and 43, just to put side by side the similarities, again, of Jesus on the cross compared, compared to this prophecy which was written a thousand years, a thousand years before he was born or, or crucified. Psalm 22, 7 and 8 tells us, All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads, he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Compare that to what they were saying to Jesus. The crowd, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. Again, Jesus, the fulfillment of this prophecy. Going on with verse 15. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. And I'm actually going to talk more about this next week as we continue with this sermon series. But in John 19, 28, Jesus says from the cross, I 
thirst. Verse 16. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Now, it's easy for us, right, to make this connection between Psalm twenty-two sixteen 16 and what's going on with Jesus on the cross. I mean, Jesus' hands, his feet are pierced. Nails have been pounded into his flesh, and we see that correlation here with Psalm twenty-two sixteen. 16. But even the first part of that verse, the dogs surround me. Now, you know, we have become so accustomed to, to our movies and to, to, to the paintings that we have this picture of, of Jesus and the thieves on these really tall crosses, right? Looking down on, on all of the people. That's not how it would have been. I mean, they would have crucified Jesus and the criminals along a, just a busy thoroughfare, a busy road, in this case on, on a hill next to a, a busy road. Just outside the, the city limits, they would not have done it within the city limits. But you know, they, the Romans, they executed, they crucified hundreds if not thousands of criminals. I mean, they weren't going to take the time. They weren't going to make the effort to build these large crosses to crucify people. Typically, the Roman cross was about six to nine feet tall. That was it. So if you, if you stand on a, on a folding chair... This is about how far Jesus was from the ground. Everybody would have been able to hear his, his voice if they were close. They would have been able to see his wounds. They would have been able to look at him eye to eye. Not only that, but usually, the Romans just left the bodies on the cross to, to rot, to decay. And oftentimes what would happen, the, the, the wild animals, the dogs, would come and scavenge the bodies. And I'm sure there were, there were dogs around that area. Again, they're, they're crucifying hundreds, not thousands of people. The dogs waiting for the Romans to leave. The dogs waiting for the criminals to die. And here Jesus is, pierced. With the dogs... The dogs surrounding him. Now we know that Jesus' Jesus' body was not left on the cross. For there was a, a rich man, and if he was rich, I, I assume he had some influence in the society he was living in. But but a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate himself and asked for the body. Maybe because he was rich, maybe because of his influence, maybe he gave Pilate some money, I don't know. But Pilate acquiesced and gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea. But usually for the criminals, they just hung. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. What did the soldiers do with Jesus' clothes? They gambled for them. And then this psalm, psalm closes with verses 30 and 31. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Future generations will know his name. It's some two, I mean, it's, it's like 2,000 years later. And people are still sharing the name of Jesus Christ. By his name, every day, millions of people will curse others. By his name, every day, millions of people will pray to their Heavenly Father. Even Time Magazine, a few years ago, but Jesus Christ is the number one influential person to have ever lived. And when you look at the Bible, God's holy word, the scriptures that point us to Jesus, the Bible has been translated in its entirety in 636 languages. The New Testament alone into 1,442 languages. And the Bible is by far the best-selling book of all time. It's not the Quran. It's not the Harry Potter series. <laughs> Although if you look, the Harry Potter series is pretty impressive, I must say. In, in total, the Harry Potter series has sold about 500,000 copies. 
No, 500 million copies. It's a half a billion. Altogether, the Harry Potter series. A half a billion, 500 million. I mean, that's just crazy to think about, right? 500 million copies. But the Guinness Book of World Records has the Bible. Its total sell more than 5 billion copies. There's, there's no doubt about it. Jesus, Jesus is the most influential person to have, to have ever lived. And when we gather together as a church, whenever we gather together, don't we proclaim his, his victory? Don't we proclaim that he has defeated sin and death for all time? Don't we proclaim that he, that Jesus, has done it? That he is the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, every time we gather together. And so today, we proclaim that Jesus is the fulfillment of Psalm 22. That he is our Savior, our Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ, the one who has defeated sin and death, the one who has done it. The fulfillment of the prophecy. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we just look at your word. We look at this psalm that was written a thousand years before Jesus was born. And we just stand in awe at the, just the similarities of, of how Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of these words written by, by David so many years before. Dear Lord, we do come today just proclaiming Christ's victory, proclaiming that, that he has done it. He has defeated sin and death for all time. And one of the ways in which we do that is, is your church is by celebrating communion. And so, dear Lord, I pray that that you will bless the elements today of bread and juice, that they might be an everlasting reminder of what Jesus did for us, that it might be a proclamation that he is the Messiah, the, 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 the Savior, the Christ, the Anointed One, who for all time has defeated sin and death. But God, we also come to you acknowledging our need for a Savior, that we have gotten off your path, Yet that through Jesus, through him taking our curse, through him taking our sin, that we can have an everlasting relationship with you. And so we just spend a moment in silent, in silent prayer, acknowledging our sin, lifting up to our repentance, asking you to forgive us. And so we pray in silence. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, we have an open communion table, which simply means all are invited to come. It's our way of saying yes to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You don't have to be a member of this church. Again, it's just coming forward and saying, yes, I accept Jesus as my Lord, my Savior, and believe in my heart that on the third day he was was raised from the dead to save me. In just a moment, we'll have you come. We'll give you a piece of bread. We'll give you a cup of juice. You're more than welcome to, to stay at the kneeling rail and to consume it and to pray to God, or you can go back to your seat and consume it there. There should be little cup holders in front of you where you can put, you can put your cup of juice.